Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Priscilla Williams, and yes, you are here at City Church this morning. We are blessed to be here and also to have you all as well. And it is a buzz as we go on discovery. Just think, for decades, mainstream media and godless educational systems have been teaming up to deceive the masses through pushing a disproven theory as scientific fact. Today, Dr. Foster, and for the next two weeks, is going to pull back the veil and allow us to see dinosaurs through the eyes of their creator. As we do, we'll see just what we find in God's word lines up with what is in God's word. And so you can help us uh, spread this gospel and allow people also to join that you know by uh, joining us on social media and pe pressing that like button, that share button. And if you go on YouTube, you can subscribe so that you can stay connected with us whenever we are online. So today, just know that we are starting a short series on discovering the dinosaurs. Thank you for being a part of today. God bless you. Get your coffee, uh, something to write with, and a pen, and join us in service. Enjoy. God bless you.
Come on, somebody ought to give God praise right now for who he is. Come on, are you alive in him this morning? Somebody ought to celebrate that you're alive in Jesus this morning. The doctor's report said one thing, but the report of the Lord said another. The report of the Lord said that you shall live and not die. That you will dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This morning, we will receive communion together. I want to remind everyone that communion is not a ritual. It's not a thing that we just do. But it is holy and it is supernatural. Amen? So if you'll prepare your elements. The scripture says in Luke chapter 22, verse 19, it says that he took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread is not something we just bypass. It is the living bread. It's a bread that once you come to him, you never have to hunger anymore. You never have to thirst anymore. You don't have to look to the left or to the right to know where your help comes from. But it comes from the Lord. So Father, we acknowledge your presence here today. We acknowledge this holy, this supernatural bread. And Lord, I pray that if there's anything in us that is unclean, Lord, allow us for the next few seconds to just rid ourselves of our flesh, of our infirmities, of all of the things that turn us away from you. And Lord, I just pray that we will do this in remembrance of you, in Jesus' name. Please everyone partake. Continuing in Luke, it says in verse 20, after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Lord, your blood speaks a better word. And if there was ever a time that we needed the blood, if there was ever a time that we needed this, we need it now. We plead the blood over every household. We plead the blood of Jesus over every single school, every single job, every single workplace, the highway. because you love us. And Lord, I pray that as we take this, we are reminded of your sacrifice. We are reminded of the whippings, the lashings, the punishment that you took, that we deserved, Father, that we deserved. And Lord, I pray that our lives would be a drink offering poured out. In Jesus' name, please partake. And it reaches to the highest mountain. Come on, it says flows. And it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, the blood that gives me strength from death. Today, 
on, say it again. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Come on, say glory. Glory. Where my Savior died. Come on, help me sing it. Down where for cleansing from sin, I cried. There to my heart was the blood of life. Singing glory. Help me sing it all. Everybody thankful for the blood this morning? The blood that covered us. Anybody thankful for the blood that covered your family? Anybody thankful for the blood that saved you? The blood that healed your body? Come on, give it up for the blood this morning. The blood that was shed on Calvary. Come on. Come on, one more time. Come on, one more time. Give God the praise. Hallelujah. of you here. Will you help me welcome everyone joining us online, whatever platform you're on. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in today. It's a privilege to have you. Today we kick off a brand new series titled, What Happened to the Dinosaurs? Now, if you're new or maybe even if you've been here a while, you may be asking, okay, pastor, why are we taking two weeks and talking about dinosaurs? Well, the answer is, so that you can be obedient to the scripture. Here's what the Bible says. Let's take a look at it together. First Peter chapter three and verse number 15. It says, but in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this, with gentleness and respect. Now, if someone were to pull you aside tomorrow and say, okay, I believe in evolution, you believe in the Bible, explain the hope that you have. Would you have the ability 
to navigate that conversation biblically, accurately, and intelligently. Well, after the, this series, after today, you're going to be prepared to give an answer for the reason and the hope that you have. You know, we're going to look at dinosaurs for what they are. And that is a fantastic evidence for biblical creation, not evolution. Now, just so that everyone's on the same page today, what is evolution? Evolution uh, is a scientifically, listen to me very carefully, disproven theory that says that all life is random and began as a single-celled organism. In other words, a pool of primordial soup or goo turned into uh, a fish. The fish turned into a dinosaur. The dinosaur turned into a bird. The bird turned into a monkey. A monkey turned into humans. Now, of course, there's no way to observe this because it happened over 65 billion years. And so that's what macroevolution is. If you're taking notes, macroevolution is from goo to the zoo to you. That's what they believe. <laughs> now, I got to tell you, people in academia like to say, oh, it takes a lot of faith to be a Christian. I would submit it takes a lot more faith to believe that all of life evolved from a single-celled organism. And so today, we're going to study a little bit about the dinosaurs. Now, some have said, okay, dinosaurs are really kind of a mystery. But the truth is, they're only a mystery if you believe the evolutionary story of their history. Evolutionists stood very, understood very quickly and very early that children love dinosaurs. So they use dinosaurs, they've harnessed the power, the imagery of dinosaurs uh, to kind of be a poster product to push a theory of evolution as scientific fact. And so here's the thing. If you're here and you're not a believer, we're, we're excited that you're here. I'm never going to ask anyone to check their brains at the door. God gave you brains. Why would we ask you not to use them? Instead, I'm going to, over the course of the next two weeks, present evidence to you. And I want you to use that big brain, that beautiful brain that God gave you, and you decide what takes more faith, to believe goo to zoo to youth, the lack of evidence, and what is called a theory of evolution, or if there is a design, there's a designer. If there is a creation, there's a creator. So we're going to lay it all out over the course of the next couple of weeks. Dinosaurs, I believe, point us to the greatest book of history and science that has ever been written, and that is the Bible. Whether you know it or not, dinosaurs have been found on every continent all over the world. According to the Bible, dinosaurs first existed about 6,000 years ago. Now, growing up, I've heard some very ignorant things. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, a small one in mid-Texas, and, and uh, I, I'll never forget, there's a pastor in the pulpit one day, he was a guest speaker, and he said to that crowd that day that God put dinosaur bones in the ground to test our faith, to test our faith so that we would believe God or we would believe the bones. Listen. God did not put dinosaur bones in the ground to test our faith, but rather support our faith, to hold our faith up, to prove that the Bible is true, to prove that God's word looks like God's word. And so the bones in the ground, they're there as evidence. They tell a story. And we're going to unpack that story over the course of the next couple of weeks. So if biblical history is true, then that means that there was indeed a great global flood and these fossils would be buried in sedimentary rock, which they are. Okay, uh, I love the scripture. It's in Luke chapter 19, verse number 40. It says, Jesus speaking says, I tell you the truth, if they keep quiet, speaking about his disciples, even these rocks will cry out. You know, I think in a very real way, 
the way, part of the way today that rocks actually cry out is through what we're doing today. When you look at them and you understand that the rocks or the, the fossils tell the story of creation, not evolution. You know, a couple of years back, I was at the Ross Perot Museum in Dallas, Texas, and I looked at Cash and I said, uh, I said something about the flood. And uh, a, a guy who was not a part of our conversation, like a 20-year-old museum worker, pipes up real loudly and defiantly says, oh, there is zero evidence of a worldwide flood that destroyed the animals. And, and before I could get a word in edgewise, like, and you are, and you are with, or whatever, right? Like, I got to even have, he looks at Cash and he says, did you know that all of these dinosaur bones you see here were found in the highest elevations of the hills in that part of the region? And these dinosaurs were found carnivorous and herbivores together. I said, hold on a second. You're telling me that these dinosaurs were found in the highest elevation of that region. He said, that's right. And I said, and they were found buried next to other dinosaurs that they would not coexist with. He said, right. I said, huh. I wonder what they were running from. And his eyes got real big. And I said, it's almost like they were running from floodwaters. And his eyes got even bigger. You see, there's only one way for a skeletal remains to be perfectly preserved. What happens if a, if a dog dies out here in the field? Well, the buzzards come along. They begin to pick it apart. They, they spread its bones out across about an acre or so. They fight over it. They pull on it. Then a coyote runs up, grabs a hip, and drags the hip off somewhere, munches on it for a while. You see, the only way for a skeletal remains to be perfectly intact is for it to be buried violently in mud, which is exactly what happens when all of the aqua systems of the earth open up at once. And all of the rain from heaven pours down at once. And the entire earth is flooded just like the Bible says it was. A lot of Christians, though, they get intimidated on this subject. Because in the science world, they have something called an evolutionary and geological column. Now, uh, take a look <clears throat> at the screen, if you will, and raise your hand if you've seen this in a museum or a textbook. Anybody in here? Yeah, hands all across the place, balcony, everybody, yeah. Now, here's the thing about this column that you need to know. Um, even though it is printed over and over and over again as a flagship icon for evolution, it has been disproven over and over and over again. Here's what the Bible says. Mark chapter 10, verse number 6. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Now, according to this table, Adam and Eve came along billions with a B. Everybody say billions. Billions, all right? Came along billions of years after the dinosaurs. That's what this table suggests. But Jesus said, in the beginning, I made them male and female. Now, C.S. Lewis once said that Jesus is either a liar and a lunatic or he's Lord and God. Right. And listen to me very carefully. If you're going to call him Lord and God, then you had better believe what his word says. And his word says that he created them male and female at the beginning if this chart that you see in front of you, if that chart were true, it would be hundreds of miles deep. Hundreds. Among the litany of problems with evolution and this chart, in places where it does exist, like the Grand Canyon, all of the fossils are out of order. It's in reverse order. And the entire top of the chart is gone, nowhere to be found. Most dinosaur digs are a half a mile to a mile deep, not hundreds of miles. And so 
all of this chart has been disproven over and over and over again. It's still used as a flagship icon for evolution. So if man and dinosaurs were created together, you may ask, why don't you find their remains together in lower levels of geological rock? That's a great question. And the answer is, you do. Over and over again, in fact, about two dozen times, man and dinosaur have been found in the exact same geological layer, meaning they were buried at the same time. Now, I told you about what what it takes to perfectly preserve an intact skeleton. It's violent mud, right? Most, even the dinosaurs, dinosaurs, whether it's dinosaurs or humans, they're all found in a somewhat fetal position. In other words, if T-Rex had the ability to get his little hands up to his face, then it would have been like this. They're curled up. They're trying to protect themselves from the onslaught, the rush of mud that no one could compete with. And so such is the case for uh, what is called the Malachite man. <clears throat> um, the Malachite man is, is there's 10 humans, and you can see they're, they're in the same type of fetal position, uh, five males, four females, and an infant. They're buried in solid, undisturbed, homogeneous Dakota sandstone which is the exact same layer that runs through the Vernal, Utah National Monument, which I've been to. And this monument is chock full of dinosaur bones. So you have man buried in the same geological rock strata as you do dinosaurs. The only way for that to happen geologically is that they lived and died at the same time time. So on what day were dinosaurs created, you may ask? Well, some people say the Bible, the Bible is strangely silent about dinosaurs. But the Bible says that God created every land-dwelling animal on the sixth day. So not only were we created on the same week as dinosaurs, we were created on the same day as dinosaurs. If man and dinosaur were created together at the same time, a good question is, why is the word dinosaur not found in the Bible? The word dinosaur was invented in 1841 by Sir Richard Owen. Uh, That's when they first discovered dinosaur fossils. I believe the word dinosaur is found in the Old Testament 25 times, but not under the name dinosaur, under a different name because that name dinosaur had not been invented yet. It's the same reason you don't find the words Netflix or bougie in your Bible. <laughs> I'm looking at the, if bougie exists, it's going to be in the Bible. I believe it. I believe it. Just keep looking. Keep looking for Netflix. Those words were invented after the Bible was translated from Greek and Hebrew into English. In 1611, the King James was translated from Greek and Hebrew into English. These words were invented after that translation. And so the ancients used a Greek word called draco and a Hebrew word called tineum. Um, The Hebrew word tineum is used more than two dozen times in your Old Testament. Draco, of course, is where we get our English word dragon. Every nation, tribe, and language has stories, drawings, legends about dragons that sound exactly like dinosaurs. In fact, Carl Sagan, the famed evolutionist, made this statement, and I quote, they sound so much like dinosaurs, we must call them something different because that would mean the Bible was true, end quote. So how does Sagan come up with the fact that Every language has stories of these dragons that look just like dinosaurs. He says, well, of course, we all used to be dinosaurs 65 billion years ago, and we are still having dreams from 65 million years ago. Look, I can't remember where I put my keys. You think I'm going to be having a dream from 65 million years ago? It might take more faith to be an evolutionist than it does to be a creationist. Now, there's all types of theories about how dinosaurs went extinct. 
I'm going to provide what I believe is my answer to that question next week. But I want to toss a few of them out there so because I know that you've probably heard some of these. Uh, one is that they used to eat a certain type of plant um, <clears throat> that uh, the, the plant went extinct. The plant served as a laxative. Therefore, all of the dinosaurs died of fatal constipation. I kid you not. I don't know about you, but for me, that's a hard pass. Okay, don't laugh at that. That's not, you shouldn't, okay, don't encourage that. Anyway, all right, um, that, so that, well, that's a legitimate theory, that they all died of fatal constipation. Um, uh, another one, I'm sure you've heard this, that an asteroid hit the earth, threw up a cloud of dust, and all the, and all the dinosaurs died from being too cold. Um, but, but I would pose the question, what if we still have dinosaurs alive today? For a moment, just stretch your imagination just a little bit. Think with me outside of groupthink. Think independently. And think about a Komodo dragon. I want you to watch this video. This is two Komodo dragons that are fighting. Now, it's my belief that if the Komodo dragon was extinct, they would call it a dinosaur. I want you to look at its dinosaurian neck. Its head looks just like a raptor. Watch when it stands up on its hind legs and is fighting just like images that we've seen in Jurassic Park. And so what I would suggest to you is if it was a asteroid that killed all of the cold-blooded animals on the earth, how are these guys still around? Next week, I'm going to show you proof that dinosaurs, we're talking about all the major ones that you know, T-Rex, Brontosaurus, were still alive in the 19th and 20th century. And so you're not going to want to miss next week. And I will answer how they have gone extinct. But first, for this week, let's dive into biblical history. What does the Bible say about dinosaurs? <clears throat> Take a look, if you will, Job chapter 40 and verse number 15 through 19. God is speaking to Job, and he is challenging Job to reflect upon the greatness of God by observing his creation. And this is what God says to Job. Look at the behemoth which I made along with you, which feeds on grass like an ox. Okay, pause. When did God make the behemoth? At the same time as God made Job. Now, Job was alive after the flood. If you don't know, Job is the oldest chronological book in the Bible. And, <clears throat> and so he was uh, alive after the flood. And God is pointing to a living creature alive during Job's time. Let's take a look at what God says about him. Verse 16. What strength he has in his loins. What power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar tree. The sinews of his thighs are close-knit. His bones are like tubes of bronze. His limbs are like rods of iron. So here God is pointing to his greatness through his creation, and in doing so, he asked Job to consider behemoth, the greatest creature in the animal kingdom. In the Hebrew, the word means monstrous animal. Now, some people have said, in fact, I, I'm going to take this moment to point out, if you don't know, that Bible footnotes are not inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. And so in some Bible footnotes, it will say that this is talking about um, either a crocodile an elephant, or a hippo. But remember, we don't use the Bible footnotes to interpret the Bible. We use the Bible to interpret the Bible. We use the Bible to understand the footnotes. And if the, if the footnotes don't match up with the Bible, which one do we throw out? The footnotes. Because they were man-inspired. Most of them are great. In this case, they got it way wrong in, in that particular translation. So <clears throat> let's take a look. If, if, if God was indeed talking about um, a hippo. Well, first of all, crocodile. Let's, let's put that one out. Do crocodiles eat grass? Everybody go like this. No. That's right. If you, 
if they're sitting on a bank and, and you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I'm good because they eat grass. Guess what? You're going to be looking at Jesus. And Jesus is going to be like, why is your neck gone? You know what I mean? It's like, it's going to be totally. And so um, they eat meat. They're meat eaters, right? They don't eat grass like an ox. So that puts them out. Now, let's talk about hippopotamus and elephant. Take a look at an elephant's tail real quick. <clears throat> Here's an elephant's tail. Doesn't look like a cedar tree to me. Here's a hippo tail. Yeah, again, you know, it's kind of like, those are pretty pathetic excuses for tails, if you're asking me. I think if God were describing those tails, he would have said something like, behold, behemoth, for his tail is like an itty bitty twig. (laughs) That's not what he said. He said, Job, his tail is like a cedar tree. Take a look at this picture. That looks like a cedar tree. Not a hippo, but a brontosaurus. I think God was talking about a brontosaurus. Alive after the days of the flood. I'll explain how that happened next week. And he's pointing to his creation and saying, I want you to look at the greatness of my hand. And how big I am. I am bigger. In this instance, God was saying, I'm bigger than your problems. I am bigger than life that has unfairly beat you down. In this case, uh, Bohemia is spoken about in Scripture is most likely a brontosaurus dinosaur alive in the days of Job after the flood. So in the next chapter, God steps it up a little bit. Um, uh, And he he talks about the Leviathan. Everybody say Leviathan. Leviathan. A lot of people say, and again, this is where common commentary can pull you off guard. It will say, oh, it's talking about a demon or it's talking about some mystical creature. Why would God say, look at a mystical creature that does not exist as proof of my power and my might? So let's just take a look at what Scripture says. Let's kind of throw out what man has said. Let's look at what God's Word says about Leviathan. Job chapter 41, verse number 1. God asked the question, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? Or a snare on his tongue with a line that you lower. In other words, he is too big to catch. There is nothing, you you can't take a cane pole out to the ocean and pull Leviathan in. It's not gonna gonna go well for you. It's not gonna be a good day. Verse 19, out of his mouth go burning lights. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke. Smoke goes out of his nostrils as a boiling pot or burning rushes. His breath kindles coals as a flame going out of its mouth. Leviathan is an awesome aquatic reptile. Leviathan had such thick skin, the Bible says, that no weapon could penetrate it. And so, This is part of the reason we know, because again, in commentary, it will say, oh, it was some type of giant whale or a crocodile. But what we know is that crocodiles have been killed with spears for, you know, thousands of years. And we know that whales don't have scales, so they don't fit that criterion. Leviathan is one of these big, monstrous plesiosaurus or mosasaurus with glands, watch this, that produce flammable material and electric spark. Now you may say, come on, pastor. Do you really expect me to believe that God made a fire-breathing dinosaur? How many of you guys remember that song? Shook me like an electric eel. (laughs) Okay, bad dancing aside, how many remember that? (laughs) An electric eel has 860 volts of currency. How many have ever taken a 9-volt battery and placed it on your tongue? Now imagine, not 9 volts, 860 volts. An electric eel, which is not technically an eel, it's a fish, but nonetheless, an electric eel can kill a crocodile with its electric shock. And so a fire-breathing reptile is just one 
flammable material away. So let me introduce you to the bombardier beetle. The bombardier beetle has complex factories that produce reactive chemicals of two types of hydrogen that are held at bay until they're needed. And then they're sprayed through a combustion chamber activated by enzymes causing enormous heat. We're talking about 210 degrees fuel comes out of this little bug. The beetle explodes out of twin cannons right in the rear end, directly in the face of its predator. It can shoot 30 times in succession. Boom, 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 boom. And ladies, you thought your husband was bad. Amen. (laughs) 30 times this thing can just keep. Okay, we're getting off course here. All right. The bombardier beetle is the Rambo of the insect world. So here's the question. Here's the question. If God can do all of that with a one-inch insect, how much more could he do with a 20-ton reptile? I'm here to tell you that the Bible is true and God is the creator of the fire breathing dragon. There's a guy by the name of Dr. Mark Mason Baker. He's a creation dinosaur scientist, and he and I have the same opinions. Uh, I, I should say probably I have more his opinion, um, but, uh, but he believes the word tineum in the, in the Hebrew should be translated in a modern text as dinosaur, that all of these words that are used to describe Bohemoth, Leviathan, many other places. Psalms talks about um, uh, flying uh, reptiles. And, and again, when, and oftentimes when Christians don't know, what, uh, don't know enough to answer it properly, they'll say, oh, it's mystical, which is a good excuse, but it doesn't add up with Scripture. We interpret what? The Bible with the Bible. Bible. And so um, this, this author talks about also many scholars. I didn't know this until I read his book. But many scholars, such as Aristotle, uh, wrote about pterodactyls being in Egypt in his time. I, I went to Aristotle's, one of his hometowns. It was Asos in, in Turkey just a few months ago. And, uh, and, and it was from there that he wrote so much of this stuff that you read on a regular basis. And he, he wrote about pterodactyls, and how people hated them. And they would hunt them down and kill them. And so... This book, along with many other books that are, that are telling the truth about the history of dinosaurs, point to the fact that what we see in God's world lines up with what we see in God's Word. So you've got to come next week because we're going to unpack for you um, how the dinosaurs went extinct. We're going to talk about, we're going to ask the question, hey, if this is true, then shouldn't you find archaeological evidence, which we do, and I'll show you that. Shouldn't you find even forensic evidence? Because if dinosaurs have been alive in the past 2,000 years, then surely we have blood samples, which we do. And so we're going to show you all that next week. It's going to be an incredible time. And so stand with me, if you will, right now. I want to pray for you. Lord, we thank you, first of all, that we can trust your word. And what your word says is that we are not an accident. Lord, we're not the result of randomness. But instead, you have a purpose. You have a plan. And so, oh God, right now, I pray in the name of Jesus that every lie that the enemy has sown in their minds, in their hearts, would be dissolved. I pray, Lord, that the seed of your word would germinate and that you would bring truth and life and freedom to people. Your word says that we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. So Lord, I pray that the truth of your word would set people free today. As we understand, we can believe your word and we can trust that you have our tomorrow. Lord, I pray for anyone that's going through a difficult time right now. I pray that they would begin to sense a purpose and a plan that's greater than your pain, than the pain that that they're going through. 
that your purpose, your plan is greater than their pain. So Lord, reach now. Holy Spirit, move right now in a mighty way and help everyone to understand intrinsically that we are made in the image of God. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord some praise. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, and I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never left. So why would he fail? Now shout it out. He won't. He won't. Come on, say, I still got I still got joy.
Come on, sing it with us. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken Yes, I've never been more glad Than I put my faith in Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through generation So I He's able to do just what he said he would do. He's going to fulfill Come on and testify. every promise to you. Don't give up, say, don't give up on God, because he won't. Well, welcome back, and we do hope that you have been blessed by today's message as we are on Discovery. And as uh, Dr. Foster has talked about, you know, do dinosaurs, did they really exist? And how do they fit in to the Bible? And the one thing is that according to 1 Peter 3.15, that we should be able to give an answer uh, to everyone who asks about this hope, uh, the faith that we have and the, to do it with gentleness and meekness. So today has been an opening for this short series and we want you to come back. For those that are, and this is your first time joining us, or for those who have come back, uh, we are so blessed to have you. We don't just say that because you could have done anything, been anywhere. But today you are here uh, to hear this word go forth. And if it is your first time joining us, we uh, love having City Family Extended. And we'd like for you to text the word City VIP to the number 94000. That way you can connect with us, fill out the information there, and we will get your information and send you information about our church who we are, what we believe, and the opportunities that we have. Also, you know, we are glad to have those who uh, are continuing to be with us. We're not just located here in Cordova, but we are literally all over the world with missionaries and assignments. And you can be a part of that. You may not be able to go, but you can partner in that. And the ways that you can do that are first that you go to our app, Go to your app store, look for City Church, and search for Cordova, and you'll be guided there. Secondly, you can go online to our website at citychurch.live. Click on the Giving tab. And then thirdly, you can text the word city to the number 888-364-4483. And lastly, you can mail in a check made out to City Church. Our address is 8200 Macon Road here in Cordova, Tennessee, 38018. As always, on behalf of Dr. Foster and the entire City Church family, we thank you so much. God bless you, and may he bless you throughout the week. Hi, Mike Shields here. In the last three weeks, we have ministered in Mexico, in Havana, Cuba, Santiago, Chile, and now here in the great city of Buenos Aires, Argentina. Yesterday, I spoke to 
great enthusiastic crowds and two great churches, three services. And we are here with 25 students from four countries that are studying our post-grad program. It's because of people like you at City Church have made it possible. I want to say thanks to Dr. Chris Foster, his staff, and all you beautiful people that make it possible. God is moving in South America. The churches are beginning to reactivate after a couple of years of restrictions and COVID and all the things you know about. But now things are opening back up and we are seeing amazing responses. And so it's because of people like you. Thanks for your faithful giving. Hang in there with us and we'll keep you posted. Mike Shields from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Bye for now.